So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this excellent webinar today. My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the National Convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance and one of the co-founders and directors of the New Economy Network Australia or NINA. Um, and I'm really pleased today to um, be hosting two excellent uh, researchers, activists and speakers looking at green extractivism. Um, but just before I introduce our speakers, what I would love to do is acknowledge country and tell you just a little bit about Ayla and Nina in case you're not entirely familiar with what we get up to. So first I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Yagara and Turrbal peoples here in North Brisbane. So I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and emerging leaders and all of the amazing folks working uh, to support Indigenous communities and uh, helping to care for country and care for each other. Uh, as always, I'd like to acknowledge the remarkable civilizational culture and governance system that has cared for this beautiful continent since time immemorial. The work that we do inside Ayla and Nina uh, is part of recognizing that uh, the colonial project of the British Empire coming and invading this beautiful continent has caused significant harm to the peoples and the places and the creatures of this continent. So we're really committed to loving place, acknowledging the impacts and ongoing legacy of colonization and playing a humble role in um, contributing to a better future for all of us. Um, as always, I invite you to pop into the chat where you're from, whose country you're on, what the weather's like, how you're feeling. It's lovely to be able to read, you know, where you are and who you are and what you're up to. So I'm not going to talk too much about our organisations, but I did just want to say that the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, um, which helped auspice and create the new economy network, has been hosting this glorious fun-filled fiesta of online events throughout September called Earth Laws Month. And I'm not going to go through the program, but I did just want to show you that we've still got, so we've gone through two weeks, we're in our third week, um, and uh, actually we're in our fourth week, and next week there's even more fabulous events. So please do check out the program. Um, next week we've got everything from an update from Awesome Humans at the Griffith Climate, uh, Climate Beacon, uh, Brendan Mackey and others talking about the real uh, issues going on in policy development for climate change in Australia uh, and how we can continue to work to take the appropriate actions as individuals and communities. We've got rights of nature. Uh, I, I do recommend Monday's session, how paying attention to rocks can save the world. That's about uh, geology and the creativity of artists connecting to the power of rocks. We've also got an awesome Indigenous session um, with, um, uh, sorry, I was about to stay, say Will Stephan. Victor Stephenson talking about fire country as part of future dreamings webinar. So there's lots of cool things happening next week. Please do connect. But right now um, it's all about post extractivism. And I'm really pleased uh, to be able to introduce Nat Lowry and Liz Downs, who are part of Nina's post extractivism hub. They're going to explain to you what extractivism is, the taking, taking and more taking of stuff from our beautiful planet and what the world can look like if we um, actually move to a post-extractive future, but some of the potholes and problems we're facing as we try desperately to shift our societies away from fossil fuel reliance to something else. And one final plug, um, the end of next week, there's an, uh, an event here in Brisbane in person. And the following week, there are a number of online events as part of Nina Cooperatives Week. So do check out our websites, um, get engaged or keep staying engaged with uh, all these cool people. But that's enough from me. Um, I'm going to let Nat and Liz introduce themselves and their work more thoroughly. Um, but yeah, so happy that you could join us. Um, Nat, over to you, my dear. Sure. Thank you and welcome, everyone. Um, big shout out to Mish, Mish and the team at Ayla and Nina because it's been such an extraordinary month. I have flagged so many things that I'm going to be watching when you, you're able to give us the videos. So I hope other people have also had opportunities um, to see the incredible program and speakers. Um, so I'm Nat Lowry. I'm the coordinator of AidWatch, which is a small NGO. We're in our 30th year. Um, I'm also the co-coordinator of the Yes to Life No to Mining Global Network. Um, and today I'm coming from Katoomba in the Blue Mountains. So I want to acknowledge the Gandangara and Darug people who are the traditional custodians of this extraordinarily beautiful land. 
It's a bit wet and misty, but quite magical outside. And I want to pay respects to elders, both past and present, and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I won't introduce Liz, but Liz is uh, a colleague and good friend of mine. Um, and I think it's really important to put up front that both of us have been advocating you know, for a couple of decades for fossil fuels to stay in the ground and the need to decarbonise. So we're not anti-technology and we're not pro-fossil fuels. However, um, all the work we do really centres in justice. And Liz um, has worked with AidWatch on this research over the past year on Australia's sort of footprint, both domestically and internationally, around this sort of concept and idea and what is happening, which is green extractivism um, and the, the raw materials needed for the sort of just transition. Um, and what we're seeing is that the supply chains for the so-called green and renewable technologies really aren't so clean, fair or just. And we really believe that this is a dialogue and a conversation we need to have. Um, I, unfortunately, internet is not so great here, so I'm probably gonna turn off my video now and ask Liz to share my presentation. And I'm gonna to talk to, I'm gonna bring it back to what actually is extractivism and do a bit of a 101. And then Liz will take over and actually present the findings of her incredible research. And we, the report will be coming out hopefully in the next week um, around Australia's sort of green extractive footprint. She'll be looking at the findings, the case studies, and also our recommendations forward, as Michelle said can we move beyond this very extractive kind of logic um, that we're in? So Liz, I'll get you to share my presentation and I'll turn off my video if that's okay. Great, so I will start with what is extractivism? So it's a really large concept and it originally stems from this word extractivismo discourse, which is intertwined thinking from academics, grassroots activists, um, including indigenous communities in Latin America. And it centers um, around the lands and communities directly affected by extractive projects. Often they're in rural spaces. However, that shifted um, in the sort of global context with things like urbanization, which I'll talk to in, in this presentation. Um, next slide. So, this concept of extractivism has traveled far and wide and it's taken on new meanings and opened up new vistas of critique as well as resistance. As you can see in this image, uh, on the right is a street march in 2015 in Ecuador. Um, and Liz will be talking a little bit of more Ecuador in, in the sort of green extractive context. Um, and Liz has spent a lot of time in Ecuador and we'll be heading there, I think in a month's time actually, and works with communities there. So um, this is an alliance of indigenous federations, campesinos, unions, and other groups that were opposing proposed constitutional reforms and government policies on a range of issues, especially in opposition to the Ecuadorian government's sort of natural resource-based development model, which they called extractivismo. Next slide. So broadly speaking, the concept of extractivism has two elements. The first being the process of extraction of raw materials, which I think most people identify with extraction, um, such as metals, minerals, oil, gas, water, fish, forests, um, and new forms of energy like hydroelectricity, uh, industrial forms of agriculture. All of these sort of involve land and water grabbing by these extractive industries. Um, you know, things like fracking, as we know, there's, there's huge movement against fracking here in Australia. Um, and we also have to remember around these, these sort of extractive developments, it's not just the actual development itself, it's the surrounding infrastructure also as part of the extractive project, like the roads, the pipelines, the storage facilities. So we also have there, you know, the the cubby station so they're like the large scale single crop cash crop plantations that definitely don't support or feed surrounding communities and as we know with cubby station as a cotton farm it has sucked up huge amounts of water and really impacted communities along those river systems and water systems and also um, hydroelectric dams it's the, it's the it's snowy snowy hydro dam there but this extractivism concept has also migrated and expanded from its origins of the sort of extraction of natural resources to also include other extractive logics. And this is really important to sort of understand. Next slide, please. 
So we've got transnational commodity flows known as urban extractivism and, and fashion, fast fashion industry is a really great example of that, you know, extracted labor, human rights issues. And that's all kind of erased by the marketing machines of these companies like Nike, just do it. Um, and this whole kind of consume, consume, consume. Next slide, please. And then you have the sort of data extractivism. So operations of digital platforms is, is basically data extractivism. For example, the development of information technologies where data effectively like becomes a raw material that can be extracted, commercialized, refined, processed and transformed into other commodities with added value, like how Amazon, Google and Facebook that are making billion dollar profits. Next slide, please. So also stock markets, the financial extractivism. And then an example of this is the gentrification of our cities, which I think a lot of us living in, you know, the biggest cities very understanding of. And, you know, example of this, a rich investor or investors come in, buy social housing with no concern for the building itself or the community it may be serving. The building is no longer a building, right? It becomes a game of buy and sell at the expense of, low-income people or other communities um, in what that building has meant for them. Next slide, please. And another extractive logic, which is what our, this, really this whole webinar is centered around, is the global transition to renewable energy, um, which you know is termed green extractivism. It's resulting in a new wave of uh, kind of reproducing the same dynamics and practices that caused the climate crisis in the first place. And there is potential and actually is happening widespread destruction and human rights abuses um, in the name of these critical minerals. And once again, Liz will expand on this like lithium, nickel, copper, cobalt, rare earths. Um, it's, you know, the corporatized and profit driven renewable energy sector that's sort of evolving. So we're seeing the greenwashing of the BHPs and the Rio Tintos, um, the same people that put us in the climate crisis in the first place. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, what we're seeing, and particularly in these supply chains, is that this has been carried out at the expense of, right, expense of the rights of Indigenous people, local communities, and the environment. Next slide, please. So understanding extractivism means understanding that nearly anything can be extracted. So the resources, our labor, data, cultures, it's a take, 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 take logic and, and not one of giving or, or caring. Um, the extractivist model is built on key assumptions. Sorry, next slide, Liz. Um, sorry, I can't get it to move over to the next slide. <laughs> it's just bumping at me. Oh, okay. Just See how doing you... nothing whatsoever. So sorry about that. I don't know what to do. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I, the next slide basically talks to this sort of um, the assumptions around these extractive models, like scientific and technological domination of nature, which is essentially considered as an unlimited pool of natural resources to be exploited mm -hmm. and commodified. The kind of existence of this like idea of a rational economic man as a profit maximizing individualistic and isolated human whose well-being depends on the accumulation of material goods. Also the concept of the economy is closed cycle driven by logic of profit. Um, and then the, this one, which I think is really important to think about, and I think this is where the shift really needs to happen, is this goal of unlimited growth as a pillar of our sort of social and economic sort of organization. Um, and all these forms of extractivism that I've just talked about are really tied up with the exploitation of people and the environment. And this brings us to the second element of the concept of extractivism, which refers to the conditions on which these extraction practice um, processes take place and whose interest they serve. So when thinking about the economic framework of extractivism, we need to confront and define the multiple social, cultural, economic, environmental implications it brings. Next slide, please. So this extractivism, this extractive logic, it really is a violent, it, it, it's violent. It has, and we've seen the legacy of, you know, extractive projects on land, like big mines, you know, abuse to life, health, land, food, water, to work, to labor, to housing, um, displacement of people from their homes and lands, 
um, violation of Indigenous peoples' rights, treaty rights, sovereignty, and including desecration of sacred sites. So I think most people would know about Rio Tinto's, you know, destruction of the Duke and Gorge sites. Um, and that they're like, whoa, it will never again, it will never happen again. But the reality is 463 applications to destroy or disturb sites of significance to local Aboriginal people lodged by mining companies since mid 2010, just in Western Australia alone, not a single one of them was ever denied. So there is a complete failure to implement any meaningful consultation and consent process with Indigenous communities or any sort of affected communities. And of course, we have the, the, the destruction of ecosystems. So air and water contamination, deforestation, biodiversity loss, which we're seeing at such a rapid rate globally, extinction of you know, many species. And as we've seen with the fossil fuel age, climate change, you know, the climate crisis that we're in. There's also um, the redistribution of wealth is in favour of developed countries where transnational corporations and shareholders and country elites are the winners. Um, and that's at the expense of local communities. And another aspect of this extractivism and extractive logic is this, this violence, which it, it comes into the criminalisation of human rights and environmental defenders. Um, use of military and security forces to protect the natural resources and corporate interests, and also gender-based violence and discrimination against women. Um, and we've seen that. I work in Papua New Guinea, and there's some really brutal case studies of the injustices to women who, um, Indigenous women who live near mine sites. Okay, so I don't know if you're still doing next slide, but we're now coming up to bringing extractivism back into the Australian context. So if we're thinking about Australia, the extractivist development model has been in place since colonial times. Um, and I don't know if that slide's gonna come up, but there's a really great quote by Galliano. Um, the extraction of natural resources in the colonies fed the colonial centers with the raw materials, energy, minerals, and food the colonizers needed to accumulate capital and fuel their development. So, you know, you have to kind of consider that in the context of Australia in terms of British um, colonisation of Australia. And a lot of the time this extractivism creates relationships of dependency and domination between the providers and consumers of the raw materials. So back in the context of Australia, we kind of need to unpack settler colonialism and this extractive settler capitalist economies that we still live in. So settler colonialism, it's a word, but it primarily is about, it's primarily about land. The clues in the name, the settler stays, establishes territorial sovereignty over stolen First Nation lands as we've seen in Australia. And there's a logic of elimination that centers access to land as the primary motivation for this elimination. The settlers and the settler state, the whole aim was to displace First Nations presence through land theft and genocide so they could establish their own direct connection with the land. This connection, the sort of connection, which has economic and cultural dimensions, continues as we know to have really far reaching consequences on First, people, First Nations peoples um, here in Australia and also in other countries like Canada and the US, um, New Zealand, where you have very similar colonial histories. Um, I'm not sure if you're doing next slides, but yeah, so to broaden this further, this is this extractive settler capitalist economies. And they're founded in the ongoing process of Indigenous displacement, dispossession, and also erasure. And this actually really stands as one of Australia's mo most, sadly, most enduring national features. And, you know, I think most of us know Australia is very much a mining state. And we also export <coughs> this model and the abuses that go with it. And Liz will be talking to both the domestic and international footprint of Australian um, corporations around green extractivism. And even with the growing movement for environmental protection and climate action, there is Australian corporate and private interests putting pressure on countries in the global south on their territories to satisfy our demand for minerals and raw materials for this green transition. So if we're addressing the climate crisis, climate action, climate policy and the energy transition, it actually means leaving big forms of extraction behind in the dustbin of history. We are all for saying no to extracting fossil fuels, 
in an ideal world, most of us would like fossil fuels to be left in the ground. However, and unfortunately, that does not mean the end to all forms of extractivism, because to create our solar panels, our wind turbines, our EVs, our batteries, and these you know, other green technologies, other forms of mining in particular, but other forms of extraction will be needed. And there's a whole panoply of minerals and metals, and Liz will be focusing on five of these that are needed for these different green technologies. And it's like we have this assumption that clean energy is sort of weightlessness. It like comes out of thin air. And I guess in the, in the case of wind energy, it sort of does. But the infrastructure that we need to capture solar and wind power is very, very materially intensive. And also EVs, electrical vehicles. They're going to require extraordinary amounts of mining. Um, and most of the minerals and metals needed, like lithium, copper, nickel, cobalt, and rare earths, are found in the global south and on indigenous land, water, and territories. And so we don't have to accept that there will be some increase in extraction for renewable technology. I mean, we have to accept. I think if we're going to have this transition, we have to accept that we are going to have to have these types of extraction. However, the crucial thing is that we might, it must sort of happen under global justice, you know, that... Um, these supply chains are fair, clean, and just. Um, they're ecologically and socially safe. And that supply chains minimize ecological destruction, human rights abuses, and pays living wages. And right now that is not what is in place. So we really need to ask ourselves, is it necessary that people, places, and ecosystems are just simply sacrificed in the name of fighting climate change? And we know there's this tension, but pro can we proactively aim to reduce this tension between necessary rapid climate action, which we all agree upon, I'm sure, on this call, on one hand, and on the other hand, that we can protect ecosystems, communities, indigenous rights that are potentially threatened by this massive new wave of extraction associated with the energy transition. You know, we've seen climate catastrophe already really impacting people in the world and some people are losing everything. However, this is also the case for those that are bravely resisting the ecological destruction and displacement and loss of livelihoods from this expansion, expansion of extractivism in the name of the energy transition. And something I want people to think about, um, and I really like this concept and I heard it from um, someone who does a lot of work on degrowth, and trying to decarbonize a growing economy. So let's come back to that limits of growth idea, or you know, we, we live in this sort of constantly growth economy. <laughs> but trying to decarbonize a growing economy is like trying to run down an escalator that is accelerating upwards against you. And for me, that is like such a great metaphor. So effectively, what we're running up against, so what we're trying to grow the economy at the same time is decarbonizing. And one of the most uh, many solutions. Um, shown through post-growth and degrowth research and has very clear empirical evidence of this in modeling studies, is if you abandon growth as an objective and additionally scale down fewer necessary forms of production to reduce energy use, then you can decarbonize more quickly. So one of the most important principles of climate, climate economics is the less energy you use, the more quickly you can de decarbonize. So remember that, I think that is like a really great thing to think of. The less energy we use, the more quickly you can decarbonize. So we need efficiency improvements. We need renewable energy deployments, but that alone is not enough. We need to scale down energy use, then we can de decarbonize more quickly. And ultimately, this would reduce the need to open up and mine more and also open up these sacrifice zones for the green energy transition. So to sum up, what we need is a new logic, one that overturns the prioritization of rampant mineral extraction, um, be it iron ore, coal, gas, copper, nickel, lithium, log logging our forests, extracting our waters. This has to be irrespective of any capitalist economic gain. And there needs to be a recalibration of this Australian settler state that properly prioritized First Nations interests over the so-called sort of Western national interest. Um, and sadly, I mean, I think we're all excited to finally get rid of the SCOMO government, have a Labor government, but still nothing in living memory suggests that any Australian government is yet up to embracing such a challenge. So it is up to us. We need to stand with First Nations people who have fought against extractivism since colonialism came to this country and who continue to fight for land rights. You know, extractivism is a very large concept and to many of us, we can't, it's, it's hard to see a way out of it, right? Out of this mindset and logic. However, 
there are a multitude of alternatives, traditional and alternatives to extractivism. It's very expansive. Um, and a world of post-extractive economies and societies really could protect cultural and biological diversity. It could be creating national and local systems of care, cancelling external debt in the global south. How about a universal basic income? You know, energy justice, food sovereignty. There's so many more. And I'm going to leave it here because I think this is a great way now to pass it on to Liz, who will be, you know, presenting the findings of the research, but also looking at some of the recommendations we have moving forward. So thank you for your time. Sorry, the slideshow was a little disrupted, but I think you hopefully got the, the context of it and really welcome any questions. So thank you. And over to you, Liz. Thank you, Nat. <clears throat> Thanks, um, Nat. Sorry about the slideshow. It was just... Um, it was mostly good, though. We, we did get to see fine, them. Yeah. It just, yeah. The, the, the white hours worked fine for five minutes and then stopped working and had to find another way. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm Liz, and um, so my main role is as a campaigner, um, so working for a couple of different groups, the Rainforest Information Centre, Rainforest Act, Melbourne Rainforest Action Group. So looking at intersections between um, forest protection and um, social justice as well. So I'm working very much at grassroots levels. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Lutruwita, otherwise known as Tasmania, uh, in Nipaluna, otherwise known as Hobart. Um, and I have no idea why my photos come incredibly grainy, but we'll just have to forget about that. And I'm just going to share my slides now. So I'm going to be focusing on, and it's, it's quite a, as Nat said, it's a really big topic. Um, it can be quite overwhelming and depressing, but it's also sort of, um, when we've given presentations before um, in the process of constructing this huge report that we've just finished writing um we've had people come on and go wow you know the extent and the scale of Australian the Australian role of Australian industries the mining industry um government mining companies investors in um basically the expansion of extraction of minerals worldwide um for you know, saving our climate for, for the green, you know, the green energy transition. So, and basically, um, Australia is a, and this is, I mean, this, this map just gives you a bit of an example of where the hotspots are anyway, for the raw material sources for batteries, for lithium ion batteries, um, which are obviously, we, you know, we know it uh, essential for um, decarbonisation, uh, for battery storage, for electric vehicles, um, for wind farms, just about everything. So, um, you know, th these hotspots, we've got uh, copper is an essential mineral that's used for every technology that we are needing for the green transition. It's used for conductivity. Um, and, you know, we've got copper sp hotspots all over the world. And here we are in Australia, big copper producer. Um, then we've got, and cobalt, you know, we think of cobalt as being, um, you know, concentrated in the Democratic Republic of Congo with slave mining and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, Australia is moving into these other areas. Well, they're looking for cobalt in Canada. They're looking for it in Eastern Europe. Um, and we are also seeking to produce cobalt here on our shores as well. Um, manganese we haven't covered in our report we actually covered lith um, lithium nickel cobalt and copper and also rare earth metals which we'll get a bit of a case study about you know, in lithium we are we are the world's biggest producer of lithium actually um, but there are other lithium hotspots but we produce about 51 percent of the world's lithium so the aim of this so the, the report that we've been working on for the past year what we really wanted to do um, was speak for front lines that we've been working with through our various um, campaign work with Yes to Life, No to Mining, and basically people that are coming forward and saying, we've got this huge effing great mine <laughs> being planned for our rainforest, for our ancestral lands. Um, you know, it's going to be for lithium. Uh, if, if the companies are greenwashing and saying it's for electric vehicles, we don't want the mine, what do we do? 
Um, so we really wanted to map the Australian role in this, to, to bring Australia into the picture, because a lot of the work that's been done on this has been in Europe, um, it's you know, been in North America. Australia doesn't have a big profile um, in terms of the activist movement yet, but it does have a big profile in terms of the actual mining and extractivism. So we wanted to map Australian companies and their operations that are expanding green mining developments in the name of climate action, and to analyse the socio-ecological damage and the human rights concerns of Indigenous people and local communities, both domestically and globally. Um, th this is a picture from the um, 2019 um, protests outside the International Mining and Resources Conference, IMARC. Um, and yeah, it can, the number of police <laughs> present, <laughs> um, you know, fighting back, basically, um, yeah, it, it was really quite shocking how people, um, you know, if our First Nations people and allies caught, caught up in this um, incredibly defensive response, um, because so many, the mining companies that were indoors at IMARC were basically there to greenwash their green energy renewable plans to make more money and they didn't want anybody interfering with that narrative. Um, I'll just go through these really quickly. My slides can be a bit wordy, but um, just so we just wanted to amplify the voices of those engaged in struggles against Australian green mining projects. Um, to share research and communicating materials with the solidarity networks of grassroots partners to support campaign and policy and advocacy. And also um, just have a go at starting to shift the narrative with framing and messaging that aids and benefits the climate movement here in ways to move forward and to develop strategic recommendations towards the establishment of Australian corporate watchdog, which we don't have currently. Um, and also to present the case to invest in alternatives as Nat pointed out earlier. And research methods, just very briefly, we did you know, a lot of disk-based research and analysis. We built a huge database of all the Australian mining companies that are out there mining and exploring for these minerals like lithium and cobalt um, uh, and copper. And we also brought in a lot of our work with front lines um, for case studies. So case studies are really, in my opinion, the most important part of the report because they're the ones that speak directly back to people on the ground who need, you know, to amplify their concerns. Basically, uh, we are a mining country as well as a settler colonial country. The two go together, as Nat said. We've got the world's biggest mining companies. Um, we've got, uh, you know, one thing, of course, is mining has been impacting in Australia for <laughs> since colonisation, just about. Um, we have 60,000 abandoned mines across Australia. Um, and... That is a figure given by Gavin Mudd, who's um, an expert well known in this in this field. Um, and hardly any of them have any sort of reparation for the environment or for um, Aboriginal or Indigenous lands that have been impacted. Um, we've got great legacies like Duke and Caves, um, which we can boast all over the world, not. And unfortunately, of course, it's not an isolated example. It's just one of the most recent. Um, and yeah, and, and we're just expanding with that legacy, basically. Then I've just talked a bit about these metals. Um, we're already producing most in half the world's lithium. Um, we're, and, and we're in the top percentages of production of these other me uh, metals as well. So copper, nickel, cobalt, and rare earths. Um, we're looking for, towards massive increases and there's already impacts. This is just a really complicated map and I'm not going to go through it, but it's just, it's from Geoscience Australia. And it's actually just, it, it, what it does is it just shows, it, it, you know, it blows my mind. It, it, the tiny, tiny dots all over Australia are mining projects that are in existence. And these red lines here are actually uh, gas pipelines. So the mining and the fracking and the gas go hand in hand. Really important. Most of these, all of these mines here are so-called critical minerals um, mines. This is where the government uh, puts has put literally in the last budget, while um, totally denying that climate change is even a thing. Um, the, the, uh, the Liberal government outgoing 
uh, put hundreds of millions of dollars towards crit um, supporting critical minerals projects for green energy and for energy security, which I'll talk about in a moment. And all of these projects require vast amounts of fossil fuels to get up and running and to keep going. Um, Australia's policy context. Now, this is really interesting because this brings in the fact um, that we you know we know we know that um, you know the, the Liberal Party in particular. Uh, would not say the words climate change without flinching. Uh, they weren't into it at all, but they were still promoting mining of all of these metals, particularly domestically. Um, and not for climate, but for energy security, independence from China, military equipment, um, the AUKUS deal, quad deal, say um, all of these trade alliances were very largely around battery metals. You know, <laughs> nuclear submarines require lots of battery metals and things like nickel, unbelievably. So, um, you know, but they then caught onto the green minerals hype anyway. And the, um, you know, the, the, the Minerals Council of Australia started to greenwash all of this and say, well, it's, for, you know, <laughs> when it suits them, they can talk about climate, um, but it's not about climate. Um, most recently, the US Inflation Reduction Act, Act um, which is, you know, basically pushing Australia to be a producer of raw materials for the US battery market, which we'll talk about soon in a case study. Uh, everyone loves this photo, so just stuck it in. Um, just imagine this lump of coal is a lump of cobalt and you'll get the idea of where, unfortunately, not only um, ScoMo who's gone, but um, pretty much the Labor government are gonna be following this um, idea as well of we're gonna dig it all up here. Um, we're just going to dig it up in the desert where nobody lives anyway. Nobody's going to care. You know, there's only going to be a few Aboriginal sacred sites that might be blown up. But yeah, you know, all good. It's all for climate mitigation. Um, quickly, a lithium mining domestic footprint. That's just a lovely picture um, I stole off an ABC News website. But it's uh, it's of a, a lithium mine that's been built in native title lands in Larrakia lands west of Darwin. It's um, This is a picture of it. It's like literally a month after they started digging this open pit lithium mine. It's all this runoff going into the water already. Um, there's been native title uh, disputes because people haven't been properly consulted about what's going to happen there. It's so, you know, this is just an idea of lithium expansion and what it's already doing in Australia. Um, lithium development projects, all these big dots are current, where current mines um, are operating. So it's hard to believe you don't think of lithium, but, you know, you think of, co you know, coal and iron ore, but these, all these places. And, you know, think, just remember also that these places particularly in Western Australia, are, are already massive mining hotspots. They're already, they're still mining all the other metals and they're just going to mine extra lithium and nickel and cobalt on top of all the other metals. Um, there's a big greenwash. Uh, it's really interesting in the research. Um, Australia is saying, oh, well, we can, our lithium is going to be so much more environmentally friendly than say mining lithium the, the bad way in this in you know high altitude brine lakes in Chile and Argentina is so much better because we're not going to be impacting on anything you know hard rock is really environmentally friendly okay looked into it it's not it's way more water intensive than um you know mining salt lakes it's way more energy intensive it basically uses fracking um, you know, it uses explosives to get the lithium out and then dangerous leaching chemicals and stuffing up the water supply. I nearly said the F word there, but I, it's a presentation, so I shouldn't. Um, but yeah, so, and this is really important. We came up with our research showing that um, there's almost no oversight and very few studies about the impacts of existing hard rock, not only lithium, but insert most other minerals in Australia almost no environmental impact studies that actually are independent of the companies who order the studies to get their projects online. Very, very difficult to find anything whatsoever. So, you know, copper is the same picture, only even more so. You've got huge amounts around at Mount Isa. You've got these massive ones. Um, you know, anyone here has been on, um, you know, campaign around, um, you know, uh, you know, the Olympic Dam mine um, in the BHP in Voxby Downs. Well, this is all, these are all the copper mines that are in that area. They're huge. There's more exploration. It's going to be, um, you know, really digging into, 
sacred sites of the Cockatoo people and other uh, people of that area. Um, so, you know, you get the picture. South Australia is really interesting because um, it's, it wants to be the first state in Australia to be zero carbon or carbon neutral. So it's done a whole lot of massive amounts of greenwash campaign about it and got a climate smart action plan. We're going to make Adelaide completely, you know, um, you know, electrified. This means a threefold expansion of copper mining to one megaton. That's a thousand tons, I think. Is it more than that? per annum by 2030. So threefold expansion of copper mining and the existing mining is already causing problems. And then in nickel, we've also got, so it's, you, you get this depressing picture with all of these maps. Um, <laughs> these are Australia, Geoscience Australia maps, by the way, they're not ours. They just really um, illustrate exactly what's going on. And just see how much, um, concentration there is and, and all these areas are uh the great artesian basin um so in fact you know just the gold fields um I'll quickly mention uh, you know gold fields has over 60 operating mines currently of all different kinds of metal um and they're planning to build a massive nickel uh, battery processing plant there and expand their nickel mines threefold in that area. So, yeah, which I've already just said. That's a great aerial shot of uh, <laughs> Australia's biggest um, tailings dam, uh, a toxic waste tailings pond, and an open cut mine at Mount Keith. It's a mine owned by BHP in the gold fields. And cobalt as well. And, and cobalt is really interesting because we um, are trying to say that we are much better than the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We are not going to use child slave labor for cobalt. Therefore, there's this wonderful term called ESG, Environmental, Social and Governments Criteria. And that is how mining companies are now struggling to increase their investments by making themselves look clean and green um, and with these, uh, de you know, uh, developing international criteria. So to say you are a tier one ESG company, everybody says it now, even when they are manifestly destroying the tar iron as Venture Minerals is trying to do at the moment. Venture Minerals is saying, we are an ESG friendly mining company. So, yeah, so, so the mining of cobalt here is really based on this rhetoric about we are just, yeah, we, we're just going to be the best cobalt producer in the world. And yeah, so the, just the next five minutes of this presentation is just going to be looking at the global hotspots, just to give you even more of a depressing picture, <laughs> um, but also an, an encouraging picture because we'll look at some of the um, resistance as well to, the, to those um, mines. And uh, so this is just for lithium. We are mining lithium in the United States, in Greenland, in Brazil, in Argentina, Chile, Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola, Namibia, South Africa, Mali, Spain, Germany, Austria, Serbia, um, <laughs> uh, Thailand, apparently, we've got a um, hotspot there as well. So this is our research is literally mapping where these mines are being explored for and where these projects are happening. Um, yeah, uh, in Argentina. So while we're busy saying we're going to move all our lithium to Australia because it's clean and green when it's not, was actually using fracking, uh, we are still going to expand in Argentina at the same time because that's even more money. So um, we're moving into these areas that have already been desecrated by existing lithium mining. Um, lots of Indigenous opposition, thankfully. Um, not thankful that they have to do it, but thankful that there is opposition and there is international support. But there is there definitely needs to be a lot more awareness. Um, we have Rio Tinto in there and some pretty big companies. Um, so there's some of the um, indigenous <laughs> opposition that uh, in Argentina in particular, where we have at least three large companies mining or wanting to mine lithium. Um, yeah, copper, similar kind of picture. We're mining copper in Canada, United States. Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, South Africa, Namibia, Zambia, Botswana, Spain, Oman, Mongolia, and of course, Australia. Oh, Papua New Guinea as well. 
um, Papua New Guinea, they're going to be chucking, uh, there's a mine there that is going to be chucking the tailings straight into the ocean. So each of these study um, countries has case studies. We've only been able to choose some of the most, the biggest, most horrible ones. Um, as you can see, well, that's a river that's been completely destroyed in Spain. And this is the Panguna copper mine, it used to be Rio Tinto in um, what is now um, Bougainville, uh, which sparked, of course, the Bougainville um, uh, War of Independence. And they want to reopen it, by the way. Um, Andean copper belt rates are mentioned because that's where Australian companies are flocking in their droves. Um, a lot of the work I do personally for the last four years with the Melbourne Rainforest Action Group, which is an amazing group of <laughs> team based in Melbourne here. Um, basically, we've been focused on Ecuador and this is because uh, we've got uh, about um, nine Australian companies looking for copper there in the world's most biodiverse rainforests. And Ecuador is just having a massive uh, mining bonanza. They've just sold off a third of their land for investors. Um, and, and the reason everyone's moving there is because we currently get most of our copper out of Chile. Um, but these, are, these mines are getting old. They And to supply global green energy demand, according to the International Energy Agency and the World Bank, we're going to need one new Escondida sized mine. Escondida is the world's biggest open pit copper mine. It's huge. Um, to be built every year for the next 20 years. So just kind of digest that. And then that's why they're going to Ecuador and they're wanting to build some of these mines in, um, you know, Escondida is in the Atacama Desert. It's not good to have a mine there, but compared to having a mine in um, mega diverse tropical rainforests, Hmm. They're not thinking it through, are they? So, um, and this is just a really um, egregious case study, which makes me kind of cry every time I actually talk about it. Um, <laughs> I really just want to go, like, it's just, so Rio Tinto, Duke and Gorge, you know, you think they'd pull their heads in, but no, they haven't pulled their heads in. They're off to Arizona and teamed up with BHP to create um, Resolution Copper. It's going to be a humongous copper mine um, in Apache lands, in sacred lands. It's going to be a block cave mine crater one kilometre deep and three kilometres in diameter, which is bad enough. And then you realise that it will destroy 8,000 hectares, including Apache religious sites that are, you know, obviously as significant as any sacred site ever <laughs> for, <laughs> for Indigenous people. Um, 1.4 million tonnes of toxic waste, 20 mile slurry pipeline through a mountain. Um, and all of this was this land swap deal where they basically said to the Apache organisations, let's um, swap the land. I'm not quite sure how they did it anyway. They, 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 they were like, you know, let, let, can we just uh, swap your land rights for somehow building this mine? I'm not quite sure what they offered them in return. The Apache said, no way, <laughs> F off. Um, there was a legal standoff which uh, recently the county court has ruled to deny the Apache stronghold motion for an injunction and the Apache are vowing to appeal to the Supreme Court. So we're getting these horrific situations now already. And the United States really wants this copper mine because it will onshore their copper production for companies like Tesla. And that's literally what Biden's saying. Um, yeah, nickel, another depressing <laughs> map. <laughs> Um, we're particularly uh, looking in Canada, again, First Nations lands in Ontario is a big one. Uh, Indonesia, rainforest destruction. Africa, again, we seem to have very little information. We need to really reach out to more people on the ground in Africa. We're trying. Um, but yeah, mainly they want to build it, move it here. So just getting a picture of, yeah, I mean, that's what, what's happening currently in Indonesia with a couple of Australian companies. Um, and before, yeah, I just want to, the other case study I want to mention is um, Linus, because that's uh, what one, somebody, uh, one of our friends at AidWatch, um, Lee, has, has been working on this. This is a massive campaign that started in 2011 to stop a company dumping this mountainous waste dump 
in Malaysia. It's an Australian company. They're mining the stuff in Western Australia. They're exporting it to Malaysia. Um, you know, it's never been safe. <laughs> it's never been. Um, there's been protests, you know, and legal cases consistently for the past oh, 11 years ongoing. Uh, and now they want to build a second toxic waste dump in Malaysia and also expand processing facilities in Western Australia. So um, that's one of the major, major case studies that we looked at in our um, report. And just really quickly, because I'm sure I'm totally running out of, no, no, I'm not running out of time. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, the findings, uh, this is where we're sort of like, okay, people are going to go, yeah, but I oh, know this is horrible. We want, you know, solutions. But also we need to be able to just have the data to say to the climate movement, look, this is not okay. Um, we cannot just greenwash this out of the water. We cannot let mining companies go. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if all the companies did honestly care about ESG? Um, but they don't. We know they don't. They, all they care about is getting rich. So they're not going to, the capitalist model is not going to save the planet. They're just going to want to mine as much as they possibly can while it's cheap to mine because it's much cheaper to mine than it is to recycle metals, for example. Um, so we know that, across the globe, Australian green extractivism is causing impacts. Uh, we've approved that through our research. Um, across the globe, there, are, there is resistance, the big groundswell, but honestly, how much are we going to have to load onto, you know, the grassroots to resist all of this? We need to do our share as well to really, you know, stop the, at the, at the demand side. Um, key intersecting themes identified include impacts, human rights, greenwashing, sacrifice zones, which is the concept of um, a place being sacrificed literally for some other purpose, for capitalism, for, you know, um, supply chains, corporate state power, energy security and militarization. Yeah, uh, these, these are, this is uh, one of the biggest, this is in Serbia um, last year, and this was uh, and the national protests against Rio Tinto's Jada lithium mine, which, you know, Europe, the EU was very excited about this lithium mine because, well, we can, you know, this is, this is onshoring our um, electric vehicle lithium battery production. Yay, we don't have to, you know, get it from China. Well, anyway, um, Serbia's, th these protests stopped the mine. Um, um, sorry, my phone rang. Um, stopped the mine. Uh, the government just said, "Look, you know, we, we, we look. It, it, they could still start it up again. Rio Tinto is appealing, but um, this is, you know, what national protests can do." Um, okay, my phone never rings except when I'm giving a presentation. Okay, so as a result of this research, AidWatch aims to initiate roundtable discussions with partners and the Australian climate movement and noting important work that includes um, a way forward after Duke and Gorge, um, you know, we had the, the uh, a way forward inquiry calling for an overhaul of Australia's cultural heritage protection regulations and a review of the Native Title Act to address power imbalances in, in negotiations based on free prior and informed consent, which is a complete myth in Australia anyway. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing we want to endorse. Um, red lines, very interesting. It's come out of a coalition of grassroots um, groups. Um, it, the original concept was our colleague, Carlos Sarija, who some of you may have heard talk last week at this, uh, uh, another seminar <laughs> here for Ayla. Um, okay. Um, and yes, so basically this is just saying these are the areas where we can just have no mining, no negotiation. This is where we want to be able to say no, the right to say no, um, you know, so, you know, for example, um, species in danger of extinction or critically endangered, um, you know, no purchasing uh, metals from sites uh, where people have not freely given their consent protected areas. So yeah, so that's um, something that was presented at last year's COP26 People's Conference. 
also uh, going as, you know, for a circular society, well, you know, we've got to start somewhere. <laughs> we may not know how to do this yet, but we need to actually stop digging up more stuff. So let's explore options. Um, and, you know, uh, our, our colleagues at War and Want have done some a really good report called a material transition, which we're just sort of wanting to give a bit of a plug to here, which is just looking at some of the um, options that for reduced for interrupting this cycle of extractivism and exploitation the right to say no again um this is a <laughs> this is a um protest last year against gina reinhardt's gold and copper mining proposal in ecuador um basically they uh, this company has just gone in gina's company has just gone in and committing human rights abuses um, forcing re forcing people off their lands, trying to force their way into the community, bribing judges to let poli federal police come in and arrest people and tear gas them just for protesting like this. Um, so, you know, we've just got to be able to, you know, people just have to be able to, be able to have the right to say no without getting tear gassed and abused by, um, you know, voracious and predatory mining companies. And yeah, finally, a post-extractivist um, alternative. E Eduardo Godinis is an amazing Uruguayan uh, scholar who has really written a lot on post-extractivism. And you know, he says here, this is why it's necessary and urgent to take forward a post-extractivist alternative. We need to consider the different options available for breaking the dependency on the extractive industries. And you know, we're talking to you, Australia, because this is, you know, Latin America is leading the way in this, but Australia really needs to kind of get its shit together if we are going to look at, really give a long, hard look at ourselves and the impact we're having on, you know, this continent and on and globally. So yeah, and our recommendations just build on that. This is a very boring slide, but yeah, in, in a building networks of solidarity, we're really wanting to expand that work uh, that are centered on justice, this one, Australian companies must be held responsible for their domestic and overseas impacts on people and the environment, and communities must have access to justice within Australia. How many people, you know, when we're working in PNG or, um, you know, <laughs> in Latin America, or, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, can you go to, um, you know, what, can you please take it, take our testimony to Australia? And, and we're like, yeah, we would if we could, but we don't have anyone to speak to who will listen. We really need to have pathways here um, to hold these communities and um, these uh, companies accountable, implementing a way forward. There's an awful lot of work to be done there, obviously. Um, Australia's policies on decarbonisation and the transition must be centred on justice and equity. It's like 101. If we were talking about climate justice, it's not just about fossil fuels. It's about this as well. We need to expand the concept of climate justice and prioritise support for alternatives to the current extractive development model, which is not going to save our planet. It's just going to make things worse. And yeah, within that, an Australian corporate watchdog would be really nice. Yeah, I uh, don't know why that's come out fuzzy. That was a great banner that we had at iMark a couple of years ago. Extractivism is not development. Um, anyway, um, and yeah, our upcoming report, which should be coming out at the end of next week by Aid Watch. So just um, we'll probably, yeah, we'll definitely watch the space for that. And um, we was, yeah, Aid Watch's allies as well. Um, yes to Life, No to Mining, Melbourne Rainforest Action Group, Rainforest Information Centre, and most importantly, front, our frontline partners. So that's it. Wow. <clears throat> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Liz. What an absolute abundance of terrifying information, but so important. If we're going to take the right actions, we need to have the right information. So um, look, I'm just bringing Nat back into spotlight and I'll bring myself in too so that we can have a chat and bring questions in from the group. Um, I don't think there are any in the group at the moment and that often happens when people are absorbing either mm. profound or disturbing or a lot of information and I think this was possibly all of the above. Um, I have a couple of questions though. Um, so you're going to launch this amazing report. Um, do you know when it, copies of it will be available so that we can share it on the Nina website? and circulate it to our contacts? Um, look, we're really aiming, you know, by the end of this month. Um, okay. I think I think it's just a 
good to acknowledge we've done this on a shoestring budget and a huge, huge thanks to Liz for the extraordinary work she's done. So we're just in the final throes. Mm. Um, We have one chapter we're just waiting um, of of some co-author, you know, the usual thing. There's a lot going on. I do understand. It's painful writing things, but they're so important when they're done. (laughs) Yeah, and when we see this, we're not doing some sort of big massive launch. We see this as opening up dialogue. Um, We really want to have over the next year roundtable discussions particularly within the climate movement because I think this is a very hard narrative to tackle and I think what we want to do is work with people to go how do we shift this narrative without losing the incredible work because we don't there's always this fear that the fossil fuel industry will go see I told you renewables aren't great (laughs) but that's not what we're saying so we have to really think about our communications and how we the stories we're going to tell around this and it's true today was a lot (laughs) <laughs> um, it sounds depressing and I think some another thing to, to mention is also what we want to do as a follow-up to this is really dive deep and, and create a really and you know I think this is something we'd love to collaborate with Ayla on is like we know these alternatives in these traditional ways already exist we need to tell those stories alongside of you know what we've been talking today so it can seem like a lot and it can seem like oh god <laughs> but I think we need to really add to that that there is already yeah. some amazing stuff out there. And I think Ayla is an incredible and Nina are incredible networks that are really driving that. And, you know, Liz and I have said, yeah, let's talk more and collaborate in this space, which is we're so grateful to have this time, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it is quite heavy. And, and I think both Liz and I have been working around the sort of particularly mining and Indigenous communities for a very long time so we're just seeing the same thing play out and we want people to understand but we also don't want to be seen as anti-technology as I said in the beginning or anti you know pro-fossil fuels because we're so not about that we just want people to understand the system we're in is not working (laughs) and we're perpetuating the same we're going to be perpetuating the same sort of things that have happened in the fossil fuel age um it's big, and, it's big stuff. <laughs> and I, I do hope that folks in this group at least understand that. And I certainly appreciate that you're not anti anything except fossil fuel extraction and nasty stuff, but we have to address these issues. And just before there's now some really good questions coming through and we'll discuss them in a minute. But the thing to remember is that, and I've said this in other webinars, in the early 1990s in Australia, when we set up the very first um, energy agency looking at climate change, the first group anywhere, the Sustainable Energy Development Authority was set up in New South Wales, 1995. And I was one of the first 20 people employed in that space. And we were looking across demand management. How do we, as part of the solution, reduce what we're asking of mother earth and reduce our consumption? and reduce our production so that we can still have a good life, but not keep wanting more and more and more. Um, And it's gotta be remembered, the size of houses in the 1970s is about the third the size of your standard house being made today. And the families are smaller. The size of the cars, two times bigger than some of the original little cars, you know? So it's not just, oh, you know, where, where people like us are not saying stop everything we're going to go back and live in a cave we're saying actually we are demanding more per head than we used to do so if we reduce what we demand maybe some of this mining will be sustainable and maybe it will help the energy transition but if we keep demanding if everyone lives like an Australian with a massive house and two cars and five TVs um, of course we're going to want to keep doing all this mining so I guess I'm just I'm really going to bat here saying this is not what this is about. Human beings have got to rethink what we demand and what we expect. Uh, And some of this is from privileged countries. So there are questions coming in. Before we go to that, one thing I wanted to ask you is, would it be possible through some kind of roundtable discussion in, in the next few months with the Green Prince program to actually start linking Oh, okay, so there's too much mining. How do we handle this? To actually look at what communities are using in our place and going, well, actually, you only need this much. So why are we putting up with these massive mines? Oh, well, actually, those materials are going somewhere else for someone else to use so that a small number of shareholders get the profits. Like actually understanding the interconnection of what local communities need, because the first thing I always hear is people panicking, oh, what? I need to do this. It's like, well, hang on. Let's look at this realistically. Place 
by place to help people actually imagine what's really going on. How much energy are we using versus what our Australian companies like BHP are carving out of the planet? So anyway, just an open invitation to Absolutely. really hook up some practice because I think we need practical messaging. We need to let people know these are the things you should be challenging because these are the outputs and things we really want, not just stop everything, we're freaking out. You know, we need some nice, clear actions that are not just campaigning to governments, but taking action in local communities to know how much is enough and where we could get that from and where we should, uh, you know, batten down the hatches and fight, fight, fight to stop stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. I 100% agree. And I think part of doing this report is really, as I said, the process of working with like-minded people that can see these issues, but how can we really communicate that and look at like practical ways of of shifting things. Um, yeah. I think also it's really important to note that for so long we've had it all being put on the individual. <laughs> you know, change your light bulbs, all this. Yeah. And it's it's not like we we have to hold who really is at account here as well, because yeah. I think a lot of individuals are really trying. So I think that's important. And that that is the hard part is being able to tell the story and shift the narratives in a way that people don't go into despair, but they go into this could be really exciting. Yeah, you know, and um, that that is the challenge I think we face. Uh, we both Liz and I have talked about that. So um, I'm very happy and open, and to anyone here, and how we can kind of move forward um, with this research we've got on how we can like shift things. You know, really actually practically shift things. So yeah, yeah, thank you. And and the narrative is there are a multiplicity of things we can do on the ground to change how we demand energy, as well as a multiplicity of things we can do at the policy level and the production oriented level. This is not just stop everything. This is think this through because under the Nina banner, what we see are people advocating for um, sharing economies, local food systems that aren't transporting food as much. Suddenly you've got a different thing. Um, re shared renewable energy sources, as well as demand management inside your own home and inside your own life. But it doesn't have to be that we return to living, you know, um, uh, in a tent, but it does mean really being cleverer uh, about some of the collective actions we might take. Anyway, enough from me. It's just something I'm really passionate about. I've watched these conversations be destroyed by the misinformation campaigns, um, whereas in the early 90s, talking about energy efficiency was uninteresting, but it wasn't hammered the way it is today since the climate mm. misinformation campaigns of big fossil fuels all right let's get to some questions i'm just going to read them one after the other because um i'm going to let you nat and liz answer this because neil's got a blunt question are you saying we must stop all mining and if so how will we exist okay so i think it goes back to your like we're all going to go back to caves and people always seem to go i, I get this all the time well yeah. you're on a computer and like <laughs> where do you think the metals and minerals came from? And like, yeah, I mean, that's a point, but it's all about reducing this expansion of mining that's happening. So I think we're always going to have some forms of extractivism. It's how we can make them more responsible, really, truly more sustainable. I mean, they're always going to be some impacts. Like that's just the reality. But for my phone, for example, why, aren't my, why isn't my iPhone just designed from cradle to cradle? So instead of it dying in three years and you have, you know, this is this is the problem. It comes back to the design of our technology. We're not anti-technology. And I think, you know, unfortunately, degrowth gets a real battering, but it's generally the, the really progressive degrowth movement. It's not anti-technology at all. It's about how can we better create this technology? Um, so they last, or if in, with my phone, maybe it's made up of modules. So if the camera dies, you take the camera out, it goes to some place where it could get repaired or it could get recycled. So it's about, I, and people go, oh, it can't happen. And I'm like, well, we can dig big holes and build big skyscrapers. We can fly in the sky. So for me, it's like, yeah, we can, but we have to shift this way of thinking of constantly extracting and consuming into a more sharing, caring, we can fix things, you know, develop these products that the user can fix it. <laughs> This, this can exist, it does exist, but we have this system in place that is driven by shareholders and profit. And, you know, that's the reality. So we're not saying, I know I said I was co-coordinator of Yes to Life, No to Mining, and people go, Ugh. but it's really about no more mining or no more opening up these sacrifice zones. Like, why would we want to open up our deep seas to strip mining? 
Why do we want to open up the last like biodiverse regions in this world, like Ecuador and Papua New Guinea to mining? So, you know, that's really what we're trying to say here, that right now what the research list has done is this expansion is going to be the most mining, it's mind blowing that will if the world has ever seen. And that's what we're trying to say is like, we don't need to be keeping opening up these new mines and, and new areas and, you know, at renewables at all costs or EVs at all costs. We can't have that ideology because we're just going to be perpetuating the same issues that we have now. It's not really going to fix the climate in all reality. I think that that's really what it comes to. Yeah, and, you wanted to add to that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the other, the only other thing I wanted to add was um, just go back to um, the, what I um, showed a few slides back was the, the, you know, the red lines for extractivism. So while we're still working out how to reduce our dependency on mining, let's just at least delineate some places that we just can't put mines. You know, just have some standards. Just say, look, yeah, you know, th th this is the world's most biodiverse you know region don't put a mine there if you put a mine here it's going to completely wreck the water system for an entire continent don't put a mine there you know if you put one here it's going to destroy you know indigenous ancestral lands and everything else don't put a mine there you know just find, i mean it, ultimately we there are probably no there's nowhere we could safely you know 100 safely put a mine but at least let's just get some areas you know just at the moment it's a free-for-all and we have to start curbing our appetites and thinking and, about and let's turn this yeah. around too and i'm sorry yeah. to bang on about demand management but we are facing a housing crisis in this country your average human being cannot afford a place to live now why the heck is that um, and it's because the property markets are the greed the way these structures are set up and so there's a massive move to downshift to tiny houses and that's hard because sometimes local councils won't let them happen. Eco villages can be hard because they have to look at sharing space and how does that fit in. So if people want to downshift, use less, you know, that's a challenge. But imagine if we can work towards the downshifting, uh, the smaller houses, not everyone, but for many people who are keen to have share housing, co-housing, it's an absolutely massive growing area. All of that actually represents a, de a demand reduction in metals and minerals because people are starting to take less. If we combine that with a shift towards localization of economies, which we saw evidently possible through COVID, then suddenly you're going, well, it's not just let's stop mining, it's actually let's change the way we live so people can be together and share and look after each other. We'll still have to do some level of mining, but let's not think about doing exactly as we've always done and just changing our energy uh, focus because that's not going to work. And anytime any of us in Australia go, oh, what if we stop mining? Are we not going to live? But try to think of the fact that we are literally in the top 3% of how people live in this world compared to folks across many other places. We're like trillionaires in our standard of living. So medium prosperity, as Mary Graham would say, you know, how do we have medium expectations instead of great expectations so anyway i won't harp on anymore but gosh it it's just something that i bang on about a lot it's true systems changes changing a whole bunch of things transport housing food systems all of that and then suddenly you don't need all Absolutely. that energy that the corporations are telling us we need so this isn't just how do we get people to stop buying tvs no that's all right hang on to your tv i love it's like thing. you know I, i'm 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 not against electrical ve electric vehicles, but why are we looking at sort of transport mobility? And like, well, why are we looking at more you know, cars? better buses, you know? better transport, uh, walkable places, um, communal whatevers? Exactly. Why do, why yeah. do we have to have all these minerals for all these cars? Yeah, they won't be bursting out with uh, carbon emissions, but they're still using up metals to make them. And why are we still perpetuating everyone having three cars? Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, we're in violent agreement, I think. So let's go up to the questions. Um, this is a great question from Walter. Are there any elected representatives who are listening to the anti-extractivist voices at the moment? In Australia? I, I, guess, I suspect if you could find any, we'd be happy to hear them, hear about them. I would say that, look, I think also this is another step for, for this what we're looking at in terms of this research is to be able to speak to decision makers and go, okay, 
We all want to move this way. That's great. We're gl excited that we have finally have a government that's not climate denialist. <laughs> but, you know, what can we do? So I think they would be particularly in the Greens um, and they probably could be in Labor. We haven't really gone into that process of identifying. I would say someone like Lydia Thorpe, for example, mm. who is very much for treaty and she's a First Nations person, would probably go, OK, I want to listen to this. Mm. But, yeah, it's not a step we've made just yet. I think in my kind of more internal conversations with some people in the Greens, they are, and in the climate movement, they are like, yeah, we know this is a problem, but how do we do this? Which yeah. comes back to what you're saying, Michelle, is we need these roundtables. We need to like, because it's intersecting. We're talking about green extractivism, but you're absolutely right. This is intersecting across all of these different things where this, these systems are really yeah. not being important. In, in Nina and Ayla, we talk about better futures and better communities, and that means redefining the good life. And if we as community folks and, and folks who are exploring these issues can literally present to our so-called leaders, or often they're the followers, um, some handy ideas about if you do these 72 things here, then you won't need all of that there. And they're often not thinking this way, but um, someone suggested, what about David Shoebridge? I would imagine a lot of the Greens, um, whether it's um, uh, David Shoebridge, who's just recently been speaking out about ecocide, which is terrific, but also Peter Wish Wilson, um, who's really an advocate for, you know, caring for the planet a whole lot more. So I think there are people there, mm. but um, I'm really excited about the prospect of us all working together to talk about what it is we want to talk to them about. You know, what are we advocating yeah. for particularly? So... Yeah, I think that overarching broader, broader messaging that you're sort of talking about, which is inclusive of people in these networks who are in the degrowth or housing, or but we do have, we have our own specific stuff, obviously, but there is really overarching messaging and narratives, I think, that we have. Hmm. And it's about really, I think, you know, Ayla is really, uh, and Nina are really at the forefront, I feel, in Australia, and we're really happy to be part of these networks for that reason. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, very excited about future discussions around this and how we can have really robust mm. uh, dialogue and, and debate even, but, you know, getting... And practical to... solutions, you know, not just fluffy universalist statements, but yeah. in this particular region, if we did these five things and did this policy change and, and these on the ground, you know, subsidies and this kind of just transition, we could make things better. Um, I, I get frustrated with the sort of the fluffy generalist stuff you need to get down and dirty and understand places to really work out what's possible so um so sally has said thanks for your work in this area i've also been trying to find information about the social and environmental effects of lithium extraction and australia's extractivism um, i can only really find a preponderance of the latter and not much of, at all of the former um, hardly even much in the EIA space or cultural heritage reports. So this is about lithium and the environmental um, impacts. Did you guys want to talk a bit more about that? Or, or you hand that over to Liz yeah. if you, you want to speak to that. Um, yeah, well, my, my answer is, that, um, you know, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Doing this, it's fascinating just how little, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there is stuff coming out from, you know, the northern part, northern hemisphere, um and that's great but you know really this this is kind of almost uncharted waters when it comes to the australian impact per se and also hard rock lithium there are a few kind of scientific studies of comparing you know the environmental impacts of hard rock versus brine lithium for example and you know which you know we you know um but you know within australia nothing because if you know what, what's incredibly frustrating as a researcher is when you're going through all of these you know you google searching environmental impacts of lithium then you get um you know such and such a company's eia impact statement from you know 2021 it's like oh you know because the companies of course they're going to be downgrading downplaying their impacts you know for cobalt for example there's no um there's hardly anything um because there's no it's new like it, 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 companies are going well we're going to make zero carbon cobalt and you know it's going to be amazing it's that no no one can discredit them because they haven't built the mines yet who knows but once they built them we could be trashing our water supplies like there's no tomorrow so very very mm -hmm. difficult yeah and there needs to be so much more non-industry funding yeah. research and I, yeah, and I think just to add to that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows about the sort of, you know, big US Climate Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, 
and while obviously you know there's some it's great that at least this is sort of happening at that level the concern that we're seeing also here in Australia is this fast tracking that's going to happen and that, that's very much underlies the Inflation Reduction Act of fast tracking um, the expansion of you know ex these raw materials that are needed for this transition um, it's a real it's a real concern and we can see Australia you know US there's so many ties there that we can sort of see that happening in terms of looking at like what will happen here and so we really need to put some things in place to go okay it's great we we, we do have a lot of minerals and metals <laughs> but at what cost and how can we make this better and I think Western Australia is going to end up being a massive hub and probably for a lot of people on the east coast of Australia that don't care about Western Australia and it's just a bunch of desert to them but it's not <laughs> like it is really isn't it's it, it's already under stress with water and it's also First Nations lands you know and so many of them being squeezed into corners from mining for so long um and while yes western australia may become a hub like how can we do it better and and how can we make sure it's just not going to become one big mine <laughs> like because honestly the, mm. the mining tenements in wa it is mind-blowing what is there um and i think you know liz your research really points domestically that wa is pretty key isn't it in this push so <laughs> Yeah, I, I assume that um, Liz isn't going to comment. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I could comment more, but I'm aware there's questions and other questions to, to address. I mean, I could also say that it's not just Western Australia. It's, um, yeah, New South, Central New South Wales is going to be a massive hub for cobalt and nickel um, as well. You know, Queensland is there's hubs for... Yeah all three of these minerals so there are kind of you know there's, there's going to be these hot spots emerging in people's backyards yeah. um, in the east as well yeah okay um <clears throat> um someone whose name we do not know earth centric has said i would like to see people in this area acknowledging the suppressed tech like magnetics and earth resonant energy nicholas tesla built his tower that put out energy no lines no wires no pollution no noise why is this info so taboo, even though we all know of the issues with elites? I don't have anything to comment on that because I don't know about those approaches. I mean, I guess, you know, <laughs> the way we get, we answer that is, I mean, it, it does, we really do need to be, um, we, we, we need to be looking at alternative solutions to things at the moment. And, and I think, you know, tech suppression, I mean, <laughs> the way I look at it, I mean, it's, it's like... Um, you know, one of our colleagues said, you know, follow the money. You follow the money. Like it, where the money is, is where things are, where things are at right now. So, you know, and, they, and there is going to be, you know, um, silencing of alternatives that don't bring in as much money for the people that are currently making the most money. I mean, and a good example is that Elon Musk, <laughs> um, he's uh, an openly, and particularly on social media, a, an open critic of, um, anything other than single increasing single car use he doesn't like the idea of um, you know creating elect electrifying public transport because he's going to make less money isn't he so because he makes his money out of evs you know so um i think we we, we we there are elites that are that are you know and and these elites are called things like black rock and vanguard mm. and they're also billionaires like Twiggy Forrest and you know billionaires that can control a lot of our media uh, Gina Reinhardt of course a big um, mm. you know example of that so we really do have to be finding ways of, of push, putting forward alternatives in a way that is accessible to people mm. yeah absolutely and I think um, there's a, we're, we're actually out of time lovely ladies and gentle folk um, but there's a couple of questions there about you know how do we make people demand less Someone's talking about um, different kinds of iPhones, ones that are made from a more sustainable focus. There are so many great ways to discuss these issues and so many positive alternatives. Um, and if at any time you get confused or you think, I'm not that, saying that you're gonna get confused, but do latch on ladies and gentle folk to the idea that um, a lovely complex web of systems change at the community local level which can push up to the kinds of policies we must have is possible. Um, I don't think many of our solutions are going to come from a top down. Um, I, can't, I can't see. I mean, we all held hope with the federal election, but now we see Labor, you know, approving these massive coal, gas, uh, oil projects. It's same old, same old. But there are 
remarkable initiatives across civil society through well-being economics, new economics, um, really old ideas around mutual cooperation and support and the sharing economy. You know, these are the earliest forms. When we did come out of caves, we were sharing stuff. There's a whole bunch of different ways to imagine a different future that is fair for everyone. So I'm looking forward to getting our teeth into the nuts and bolts of some of this. Um, and I just want to flag with all of you, um, there's a couple of really cool things on the bubble. And it might sound a bit separate from this idea, but some of the folks in Nina are looking at having um, a week of webinars discussing Nina Town. The idea of taking all the cool ideas and mapping them onto particular places and saying, what would it look like if we did this and we did that and we allowed for this and we brought this in and actually trying to quantify specifically how you would, might try to do that. Um, and I think that there is a place for this kind of place-based work connected to the work you guys are doing to understand what are our Australian companies up to. We know they're going off to other places and trashing the joint. I want to know, I want us to show where that profit is going and where those minerals are going, um, how more and more people can demand um, that less and less and less of this work is happening. Um, and look, maybe we are pushing poop uphill, but I, I believe passionately that the solutions are all there, but we have to rearrange how we think about how we live and what we do. So it all starts with redefining the good life and not being frightened, because that's what they do. And Richard Dennis is fantastic at this. At the Australia Institute, he'll say, now, hang on, just have a look at how many actual jobs there are in the mining industry and have a look at, like when you break it down and look at the truth of what these big companies keep scaring us with, oh, if we take out mining, people will lose their jobs. Well, yeah, but there used to be a whaling industry and it's gone. There used to be photo development shops and they're gone how do we transition to other futures and how do we work that through? Because no one's coming to say this. That's the bad news. Yeah, 100% uh, hundred percent agree, Michelle. And I, I'm really grateful for all. I just had a look at the chat and there's some great conversations and questions yeah. in there. And, you know, I think there are more of us than we probably realise that can see what's happening and want to change. But I agree that um, we... <laughs> They'll always undermine our solutions or our ideas. We know that. We just have to ignore that. They, they, like the narrative of, um, you know, my, mining has created our economy and creates jobs. It's been bullshit for a long time. But we have a revolving door of fossil fuel industry and the yeah. <laughs> politicians. We know this is ingrained. You know, this has mm -hmm. been opened up for many times. So I think we just know that and we keep working the way we are. And we keep, I, I agree, that whole building upwards. Yep. We know how change happens. So, yeah. uh, But the more of us that can come together with the diversity of the areas that we're working in, I think is really, really important yeah. around and the common ground that we can see in, in yeah. what we're doing. And I love that, you, you know, you guys are really digging into the nuts and bolts and the truth of what's happening, not just rumours and scaremongering, but this, uh, this, these are where the minds are. These are the companies responsible. This is the argument they have for the kinds of tech we think we're developing. What can we do with this information so that we can be a force for good? So, um, And there's resistance and there's community resistance yeah. and we need to hold solidarity with all those people. That's part of this whole thing as well. So, yeah. you know justice and solidarity and keeping the, the caring imagine a world where we sent things on caring and sharing like wow it'd be incredible <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice um look as a final <laughs> question sally has asked where will the report be available um look the work that liz and nat do is separate from nina but as soon as they give me any hint that it's available it'll be front and center on the homepage of the website, sharing it with people. Um, Nat and Liz pretty much lead the post extractivist hub inside Nina. Just a quick reminder, the new economy network is built on these ideas of a distributed governance model, meaning lots of hubs of people who love a topic, bringing those ideas into the network with no major centralized control. We have a board of directors, but that's just to keep the ship afloat with the tiny amount of little money we have, we, we do that. But the hubs themselves say, we're bringing this info into the network, what are we gonna do with it? So as soon as Liz and Nat give us the nod, we'll throw it on the website and have more discussions whenever you're ready. And I'll start bashing out some serious ideas, damn it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, look, thank you so much, Nat and Liz. Um, really appreciate your um, incredible work. And I know what it's like producing really big reports on a tiny budget. It's utterly exhausting. So I hope you can have a nice sleep this weekend. Know that there's an entire group out here ready uh, to read your materials when they come out. And thank well, you. It's all. definitely much. It's definitely Liz. Liz heads. 
absolutely led on this front and it's been extraordinary uh, watching her plug away and plug away. So <laughs> excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and this recording will be available to everyone who registered in a few days, and it will just be up on the, the Nina website by early or mid October. So, thank you everyone, and have a good Friday. Hey, go forth and enjoy yeah. sitting in the garden or watching the rain because uh, it's human beings can do many things without using metals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, loves, take yeah. care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. <laughs>